everyone, my name is Kirthi Nalbotu and I'll be presenting on elderly healthcare and assisted living. For those of you watching the recording today, it's July 16th. So I'll first go over a little bit about me before we dive into the introduction and background of assisted uh, living and elderly healthcare, the significance of them, current situation, obstacles, before finally making our way to the future. So a little bit about me, I'm a rising senior in the Bay Area at Amador Valley High School. I'm pretty involved in school, uh, school clubs. I'm the current co-president of our school science Olympiad team, president of our biotech club and VP of our bio club. I'm currently also a council member in Congressman Eric Swalwell's Youth Congressional Council, and I volunteer at my local senior center. I also compete under varsity speech and debate. And lastly, I love to make films. So in terms of future interest, I'm not completely sure yet, but I wanna make a positive impact on as many people as I can. And as of this current moment, I'm interested in pursuing maybe bioengineering and computer science as potential career choices. So to begin, I'm gonna to try to set the scene here in terms of population growth. So looking at this graph encompassing data from the UN population projections, we see a massive increase in population in the next 80 years or so until we see sort of an upcoming plateau. Now, the interesting parts of this graph, though, lie in the individual growth of different age intervals. So looking at people aged 25 to 64, we see a massive decrease in the rate at which they're projected to grow. And the same is true with children under 5 and those under 25 and 15. This is completely not the case, though, with those above 65. We're projected to nearly double in size from 728 million to almost 1.55 billion by 2050. And by 2100, there's gonna be almost 2.46 billion in terms of 65 plus population. So in many countries, more than one fifth of the total population is projected to be 65 plus. And this map is just showing the projected 2100 population for various areas of the world, emphasizing the globalness of the issue. So why is this significant to us? Well, by 2050, we may have loved ones at 65 plus, and by 2100, we'll be well beyond that as well. And as we age, our vulnerability increases too. So this can be physical, emotional, or just an overall inability to care completely for ourselves on our own. In other words, in most cases, there's going to be an obvious decrease in well-being. So loneliness actually tends to plague the elderly as the um, one fourth of adults aged 65 and older are categorized as socially isolated. And within the United States, 27% of elderly people living in communities live alone, meaning along with isolation, they also have a lack of support in terms of care or aid at times during their lives when physical disabilities run rampant. So well-being is something we need to tackle in terms of elderly health care. And in general, well-being is a term that can mean different things for different people, but often begins with well-living. And in the United States, we have several forms of assistance uh, for elderly health care, and they're shown through the forms of assisted living, skilled nursing centers, long-term independent care facilities, often referred to as senior living villages. Um, and there's also personalized home care, which became more popular in the past few years. So I'll be addressing assisted living in the next few slides. So what exactly is assisted living? Well, it's sort of a balance between self-care and assistance. So the residents don't have the capacity to take care of themselves fully, but they need a bit of assistance, not full on nursing care necessarily. So coming to assisted living in America, it's pretty well established as in we have almost 28,900 assisted living centers in the US. I actually volunteer at a local assisted living center and skilled nursing sections. And um, as we can tell by the statistics, assisted living is well equipped here and 83.6% have pharmacists present, and more than 80% have nutrition assistance. Now, obviously, this varies between centers, and that being said, taking into account the numbers, in America alone, there's going to be more than 120.61 million 65 plus people by 2100, and that's almost 25% of the population at that point in time, and currently, there's only around 60 million. So, in other words, we're bracing for a doubling in the elderly population which means that even within America, we need to be developing our assisted living centers further to accommodate more people and care for them. So turning our focus to China for a moment as sort of a case study, the situation is much different, obviously because of the major differences in population demographics, equality, access to resources, and overall the situation is just vastly different. In China, 22.9% of the elderly, age 60 and up, live in poverty. 
So digesting that for a moment, one in five live in poverty. On top of that, the Chinese one-child policy has lasting effects well into 2050, shown by the graph, and we see the 65-plus population double by 2050 to over 365 million, which looms around almost 26% of the population. And on top of that, part of the concern in a country like China, and this applies to several other developing countries as well, we see a massive shift in the young people moving toward more urban areas and other countries leading not just to the brain drain situation, but also a lack of care that used to be present in terms of familial care uh, for the elderly, which was the norm. And now there's just a much different situation in terms of higher elderly population in rural China and even suburban areas living alone with disabilities. And to add fuel to the fire, there's also a lack of trust in investing in assisted living because of a growing number of retirement home scams as people find that assisted um, living programs aren't just sufficient enough to care for the growing elderly population. So after setting the scene in China, we can look to other countries like India, and we see sort of a similar situation with a rising elderly population, complemented by a mass migration of youth moving to urban areas in other countries such as America. And we can also see it in Malaysia, Brazil, Mexico, and several other countries. So to put, the, to put together the situations in these countries, we see a few recurring obstacles for people, some examples of which I already mentioned, but these factors include um, poverty, cultural barriers, overall access to healthcare, lack of trust in physicians, and so on. And these obstacles are exacerbated by the pandemic, further emphasizing the need to develop more assisted living centers that create trust and allow access to resources. And to just emphasize how universal these obstacles are, even in America, 49% of baby boomers don't trust elderly healthcare providers. And in India, almost 20% of the elderly cited high cost of treatment as a reason for poor health during the pandemic. So in terms of the future, the question becomes, how do we go about making elderly healthcare accessible through assisted living and health resources while garnering the trust of individuals? So the term globalization has been seen a lot in terms of technology as we see a worldwide dispersion of various tools and resources, but the same term can also be applied to elderly healthcare. Providing worldwide access to healthcare is a complex issue, but many foreign companies have actually tried to set up centers in other nations in the hopes of expanding their influence. And to give an example, in 2019, Australian-based senior living giant Lend Lease invested more than 400 million in a project in China to create Ardor Gardens, a luxury senior living pilot program. However, the complexity of this issue shows when we take into consideration that if 22.9% of the Chinese elderly population is living under poverty, there's a very low likelihood that they would be able to, in fact, afford such expensive services, even if they're available to them. In fact, the spokesperson for Lend Lease claimed on Bloomberg that, in fact, their services really only worked for about 3% of the Chinese elderly population. So elderly healthcare is nuanced in that it's a hard problem to solve and requires a bit of everyone involved. Government support is necessary, confounded by national and international corporate support, and along with investment into senior living. And in the next few years and decades, research is extremely important because the more research we have, the more understanding we can build in terms of what we need to do in the, to be honest, quite near future. And what I've presented in the past 10 minutes is just scratching the surface in terms of the pretty demanding situation we see ourselves in. Because elderly healthcare is an invisible problem to most of the youth, but 30 years from now seems like a long time, yet the infrastructure we build today is what will keep us afloat in the next few decades. And creating sustainable and efficient living spaces promotes well-living. And it's through well-living that well-being can truly flourish. And our parents and loved ones will be either the beneficiaries or victims of the programs and investments that we end up making today in the issues of elderly health care and assisted living. So um, thank you and my acknowledgements. I really thank my family for supporting me through this um, program and just uh, researching assisted living. Thank you to GHLC at GHU for giving me this opportunity to present and um, this platform. And also thank you to Creekview Senior Living and Roseanne for giving me the opportunity to experience and understand assisted living firsthand at the local senior center. Um, and here are my resources um, and references that I used.
And thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can find me at this email. Um, if you should shoot me an email or you can DM me on Instagram. Hmm.